welcome everyone. I'm excited that you guys are here with me. Uh, so my name is Eddie Carson, and I'm an independent historian. I primarily focus on elements of race and religion. I have a couple projects that I'm working on right now that I'm really excited about. I am really I'm trying to work, wrap up a book on that really looks at W. E. B. Du Bois's experiences while he was editor of the Crisis Magazine in terms of how his works really influenced black migration out west for a period of time before he resigned in 1934. So that's kind of the highlight of the focal period of my stuff. I also have a, a paper that I'm working on on W.E.B. Du Bois as a reluctant communist, but it really showcases his excitement in joining the Communist Party, uh, particularly over a period of time in his lifespan, as many of you may or may not know. And I will be at, at Clark Atlanta University at the end of February to deliver a paper at their symposium that focus on a Victorian Du Bois. And, and that's really, that seems kind of interesting for the fact that I'm linking him to Victorian aspects, but yet here I am talking about Du Bois as a radical. Uh, so that's a, another long conversation in many ways, too. Well, so I'm excited to be here. I'm excited about my work, my engagement in the Communist Party, and I'm most excited uh, about you know, my academic work as it relates to primarily Du Bois, though I do delve into King quite a bit. Uh, I am from Montgomery, Alabama, and as I was explaining to some folks, I'm still making an adjustment to the northern climate. It is unbelievably cold here just north of Boston. So as a Southern boy um, who has a hardworking black mother living in Montgomery, Alabama, one who is a, is a voter uh, down there who really is working to, as a, is a working class person to defeat the ruling class, I, I tell my mother all the time how extremely proud I am of her as my family primarily reside, reside excuse me, in Selma, Huntsville, Alabama, and in my hometown of Montgomery, Alabama. So I, I wanna get started, and as I start this, I, I do want to make uh, one quick, brief kind of caveat uh, notion here, and that is, you know, this is my lens of Du Bois, and, and I credit Du Bois for my attraction into the Communist Party. I first read His Souls of Black Folk my junior year in high school, and then that forced me really to um, focus my academic work, research, and even later studies on a realm and attitude of Du Bois. So here, the radicalism of King and Du Bois, as I share some thoughts and some slides along the way, <coughs> I ask that you, you know, if you have a thought or a comment you'd like to add, please feel free to do so and a question uh, to ask as we move forward. So here in the dawn of the 21st century, on the eve of Martin Luther King Jr. Day, in this year, we ponder the 50th anniversary of his assassination in this year, we also continue to keep in mind the 150th birth of W.E.B. Du Bois. And in doing so, one of the things we know is the fact that King is largely remembered for having a dream. And while his I have a dream speech stands at the pinnacle of what Americans know about him, King's objectives have yet to be heard. His radical capacity was shaped by measures other than a phrase, not the color of your skin, but the content of your character. King articulated a radical message, still in unheard, due to his anti-poverty, anti-materialism, and anti-war message, shaped within the framework of capitalism, and often ignored by the American ruling class in a pervasive silence of liberals. That being said, I, I want to point out one note that growing up most of my life, I didn't like King. In many ways, I felt like he had been extremely whitewashed, very passive. And I would say it was probably only in my, um, I was already out of graduate school and in my mid to late 20s when I really started thinking a little bit more about the expansive capacity of King and how, unfortunately, we've narrowed King. A lot of folks will be celebrating King tomorrow. And yet, oftentimes, what you're going to hear is we should, as we should, love our brothers and our sisters, but yet the narrative of King is going to come up quite short in many ways. King sought a revolution that challenged American capitalism. And because of that, just over half of black folk did not care for some of his vision, particularly his vision in challenging the economic circumstances that dwelled in inequality promulgated by capitalism toward the end of his life. And that is true for about 75% of white folk. Folks are not close to achieving this real dream today. His real, I have a dream, if we're gonna play off that speech. Many do not want to hear his real dream insofar as the fact that he, King, was too radical 
for the American consciousness of that time. I like the radical king personally, but boy, growing up, as I noted, I hated the king I was taught to love. Yet King was neither the first nor the last black radical in our lifetime. Before King, there was W.E.B. Du Bois, whose transformation was seen as he wrestled with his understanding of the international question and issues of global communism. Du Bois was a contradiction at times, though he shared Vladimir Lenin's interpretation of modern imperialism. However, Du Bois was aware of their differences when it involved a colonizer and a colonized. It was Du Bois who would study Marx, and he who would intertwine those narratives in his working with other global communists, only to join a party, of course, late in his life by 1961. And one point to keep in mind as we move forward as it relates to both King and Du Bois is that I'm not going to give much of a biographical narrative here. Uh, I've already had to edit exponentially um, to get this down to a reasonable framework. And there's so much left and so much that will be un unsaid, unheard. And so I invite some thought and some um, clarification as we move forward. So I, I think back to uh, a number of years ago when I first started delving into Du Bois's application for some of my research. In, his, in Du Bois's 1961 application to join the Communist Party, the Massachusetts-born American sociologist and civil rights activist wrote, quote, capitalism cannot reform itself. It is doomed to self-destruction. No universal selfishness can bring social good to all. King would also study Marx, and King's look and vision would be a little different than that of Du Bois, obviously. We know that Du Bois is going to essentially evolve in his radical nature as he continues to learn and come to see the imperialization of the world. And that transformation will drive him in a different way, making him a much more pronounced radical uh, at times. Yet, King, who's also going to study in a sense, will delve into this. And as I read from this um, source here, King will say, in short, I read Marx as all of the influential historical thinkers, from a dialectical point of view, combined a partial yes and a partial no. Insofar as Marx pointed out in a metaphysical materialistic fashion and ethical relativism, a strain in terms of totalitarianism, I responded with an unambiguous no. King would go on to say, but insofar as he pointed to weaknesses of traditional capitalism contributed to the growth of a definite self-consciousness in the masses and challenged the social consciousness of the Christian churches, I responded with a definite yes. So King would go on and he would spend time really studying Marx and he would never become a communist and he would never join a party. But yet by the time we get to the end of his livelihood, he came to recognize the realities and the offering that socialism offered to the United States, particularly in his early campaign against poverty. As we look back to even out of Du Bois, one of the things that we all know in the life of the radical Du Bois is that he set sail for Ghana in self-exile, in which he would later join the Communist Party, USA. Du Bois was a communist. Yes, he was a communist for many good reasons. I think he is being honored because he championed a vanguard of open, excuse me, of working class advocates. Today, we honor Du Bois in so many ways. Du Bois literally transformed the concept of race and class in America. In an article published a few years ago, this article stated, and note this article is going to be linked to the struggles of Du Bois's hometown in Great Barrington, Massachusetts, in which his own community rejected him. I quote, he's the most famous Du Bois son of a quiet mountain hamlet in western Massachusetts. But until recently, People looking for signs of W.E.B. Du Bois's life and legacy in Great Barrington would have had a hard time finding them. The civil rights activist and black scholar is said to be featured prominently as the town readies to, so, to celebrate his birth. In addition, a portion of the river walk in Great Barrington has been named in his honor. And organizers are planning a Du Bois guided tour of the town. You can see here this mural that's located in Great Barrington, Massachusetts, whereas for a long period of time, you would go to this community in the absence of the voice was definitely present. In previous years, almost all planned events or projects were met with resistance by residents upset over the fact of his radical views, the idea that W.E.B. Du Bois 
in the end or towards the end in the twilight of his years would declare himself a communist and join the Communist Party USA. Du Bois was a race man, but evolved into a global intellectual within a radical leftist framework as he fought for the liberation of people in the darker lands, as well as those occupied by the forces of capitalism. Du Bois persistently juxtaposed the American race problem to the endemic forces of global imperialism vis-a-vis -vis capitalism in a fashion shaped through the lens, or through his lens. As noted, quote, the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. As we all know, the voice famously illustrated a recasting of that sentence inaugural iteration, most famously in his work, The Souls of Black Folks, published in the year 1903. But as the concluding sentence of the to the nations of the world, the statement collectively constructed by participants in the Pan-African Congress of 1900. Thus, in understanding the Russian Revolution and black oppression, one must not attempt to recount Du Bois's life and legacy as a Pan-Africanist or iconic civil rights activist, or as other scholars have addressed, but to simply measure him by his internal struggles and of course the maturation and his growth into his radical framework. He would champion black working class in a way that reflected his later claim to being a communist. So I bring us to December the 12th, 2017. I mentioned that my mother is a celebrity. She's a, a black, voting female in Montgomery, Alabama. And as we all clamor to the TV and watching what would be, what, um, what I saw as a transformative point in many ways, I bring back Doug Jones, uh, the elected senator. So December the 12th, 2017, Doug Jones became the first Democrat to hold an Alabama Senate seat in uh, roughly 25 years. This occurred in part thanks to the support of black women in Alabama. Many who also remembered Jones, who prosecuted two Klansmen responsible for the death of four young black girls at the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham. Upon the death of these girls, as one walked into the church, one cannot help but note what James Baldwin saw. I'll put this image here. The one to the left uh, is gonna be the uh, image of Christ hands and face shattered through the glass, and the one to the right, uh, a, a new rendition uh, within a church. Baldwin stated, the absence of the face is something of an achievement. Since we have been victimized so long by a Christ of white supremacy, though a sense of fear further set back, Baldwin had found hope in an unfortunate symbolism of seeming defeat. Baldwin, a non-religious person, echoed a sentiment when he wrote, if Christ has no face, and then we must give him a new face, give him a new consciousness, and make the whole ideal, the whole hope of Christian love a reality. As far as I can tell, that has never really been a reality in the 2,000 years since his assassination. And no, Baldwin's talking about the assassination of Christ, this faceless Christ in his church, illustrating the victims um, who suffered at the hands of white supremacists, the bombing that would later really bring endemic pressures in terms of changing the culture in the state. Five years before the assassination of King, Baldwin made a prophetic statement in his justification of a savior as a symbol. And I want you to hold on to that. Think about this notion as a savior, as a symbol, whether you're religious, spiritual or not, this notion of Christ, the Christ of all people, the Christ of communists, the Christ of black folk, the Christ that both W.E.B. Du Bois and Martin Luther King Jr. will come to see as a walking Messiah for black folk, but particularly for all folk that's there. It is not about the religious aspect, as many are not religious when we think about this Christ, or we're thinking about a symbol, but it serves as a message about him for the oppressed to elevate against persecution, against the working class that really seeks to oppress those struggling with everyday realities. Baldwin did call for a boycott of Christmas, as real Christmas should seek the radical nature of Christ by not celebrating the materialism and economic injustice on a day for which Christ was born. Americans should focus on the moral right. King would echo Baldwin's message four years later in 1967 in a radio announcement when he stated, I quote King, peace on earth. This Christmas season finds us a rather bewildered human race. We have neither peace within nor peace without. 
Everywhere paralyzing fears horror people by day and haunt them by night. Our world is sick with war. Everywhere we turn, we see its ominous possibilities. And yet, my friends, the Christmas hope for peace and goodwill toward all men can no longer be dismissed as a kind of pious dream of some utopian. If we don't have goodwill toward men in this world, we will destroy ourselves by the misuse of our own instruments and our own power. The darkness that showcased the evils of white supremacy further reminded the American consciousness that the era of civil rights was just the start. Even as whites during the period were compelled to open their schools, their restaurants, their neighborhoods, even to some extent, though we know the, the, the oppression continues, the ballot box to all people of color, they held fast to the vision of whiteness as noted in the constant segregation found in churches. The death of the four black girls at the 16th Street, 16th Street um, Birmingham Baptist Church was just not radical enough to change the hearts and minds. Langston Hughes lamented. Four little girls who went to Sunday school that day and never came back at all, but left instead their blood upon the wall. King would explain why those girls would never hold hands again as he marched down the street, black brother with white brother, black sister with white sister, holding hand and champion this idea that we can come together and bring about societal and social progress. King's radicalism would take, a, would take back Christ from white supremacy. Keep in mind, King is going to take Christ back. King and his followers are going to rescue this Christ. Jesus was the same symbol used by white supremacy in lynching black folk, and yet would be used during the civil rights movement to rescue Christ, a symbol against the greed and material culture. How can the Son of God be used in driving white hate and yet serve as a symbol for unifying black and white folk and tackling the injustices that were ubiquitous? King, addressing the continuities of white supremacy, was just the student, as W.E.B. Du Bois would fight the war of racism and inequality for nearly a century. Though debated among historians, Du Bois, the teacher, looked to Christ to explain the darkness of man and elevated a need for a socialist society predicated by radical communist ideals that were in place. As we can see here, this notion of Klansmen in the years and awakening of that of W.E.B. Du Bois as this image was once run through his Crisis magazine. In Du Bois's Gospel According to Mary Brown and her child Joshua, who represents one of Du Bois's black biblical characters, which found comfort among those who were societal outcasts, he, who was the black Jesus Christ, that being Joshua, came to earth. And when he came to earth, he marched with the poor. He marched with sinners. He marched alongside communists. He marched alongside people calling for a radical reconstruction and a revolution on earth in order to really serve the purposes of me, that of the real Christ. However, this Christ who came to earth, well, whites didn't embrace him. Not this Christ, not this Christ who is going to walk side by side with black and, with black and white brothers who are unified. Yet the white South would lynch this Christ because they could not accept a Christ that accepted all people, especially the American Negro. Because of this, the very people who waited for him, the Christian South, they killed Joshua. They killed one who walked with the poor, with sinners, with radicals, with communists. The image here that you can see portrays Christ arriving to save his people, but not the Jews, enslaved and persecuted black folks. This persecution that had daunted um, decades and decades of black folks. We think back to blacks during the days of Harriet Tubman. She used tales via um, singing to describe Christ coming to save the souls of folks, to save them from the, from the bondage of Egyptians, to take them to the promised land. It would be Tubman, also, as we know, called the Black Moses would guide them into the land, as noted in the days of the Exodus, and guide them enslaved folks across the Red Sea into various elements, much like Black folks escaping the white supremacy of American society who would be guided to the promised land of the North. And yet, even when the North failed them, they would move further north to Canada towards that star, the same star that Christ, or that many sought to find Christ. 
This image here comes from Christmas in Georgia, again, published in Crisis Magazine under the editorial influence of The Voice by Lorenzo Harris, and taken from the December 19, 1916 issue of The Crisis. The caption reads, in as much as ye did unto the least of these, my brethren did it unto me. It's a fabulous picture if you've never seen this image before. As you can note, many folks in Georgia in the white South who had waited the arrival of Christ, who had prayed weekly, uh, monthly, yearly, by each decade for this Messiah to come, and yet he came. And one of the things that happened is he told these white Southerners that as you lynch this brother, you too lynch me. Du Bois would further note his evolving radical nature via his editorial leadership as noted in a crisis magazine. In July 1928 issue, he framed an essay in which he stated, in this issue here, I quote, Congress has given some relief to the poor millionaires by reducing their income taxes and their taxes on corporations. This will make the nation safe for uh, plutocracy. He delves into this idea here that how can you continue the fate, the government, with averse poverty in place, continuing to persecute the many who struggle, and yet you continue to enwealthen the many who have much wealth at hand. Like his predecessor, King expressed grave concerns regarding plutocracy and a lack of cooperation in helping the poor. As noted by a Dr. Quentin Young, he recalls a point King made in 1966 in Chicago, and when he expressed an often refuted statement, and this is a popular statement I suspect many of you have heard, I quote, King stated, of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare, excuse me, of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. Health is what allows you to do to accomplish, to socialize, to play, to work, to express. In the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. We think about the realities that are happening today, people seeking to achieve gain and measurement by removing health care, by removing livelihood, by removing the things that make us human beings, because many believe that to be healthy, to function, to have a living wage, that is a privilege. That is something that a humane nation doesn't operate on. And King pushed back as did Du Bois on such thing. It also speaks to the evolution of King's thinking toward the end of his short life. Just weeks before he was assassinated, he was a busy organizer um, getting things ready for the poor people's campaign, as we've seen really moving in the right direction here in, a 20, in the year 2018. The poor people's campaign, as noted in King's final book, Where Do We Go From Here? chaos of community. He forcefully argues against poverty for all Americans. He addressed matters such as, well, how do we fix the nomenclature of this identity seen as this American reality when we have a lack of education? There's a lack of jobs, opportunities, poor housing, and a need for a guaranteed wage which continues to escape so many people. King, frustrated by the slow moving nature of this country, will later articulate a goal for the state. In defending the plight of workers, he prepared a sermon for which he never delivered. America is going to hell. King states, and I come by here to say that America too is going to hell if she doesn't use her wealth. If America does not use her vast resources of wealth to end poverty and make it possible for all God's children to have the basic necessities of life, she too will go to hell. And I will hear America through her, through her historians, years and years and generations to come, saying things like, we built gigantic buildings to kiss the skies. We built these huge bridges to span the seas. Through our spaceships, we were able to carve highways through the stratosphere. Through our airplanes, we were able to dwarf distances and places in time and chains. Through our submarines, we were able to penetrate oceanic depths. And yet, all of these things happening, we're not radical enough to do the things a radical Christ would do, as noted on this image here, published early on by W.E.B. Du Bois. Again, this is Art Young. And take a second and just look at this image. It's fascinating. Wanted for sedition, <laughs> criminal anarchy, 
vagrancy and conspiracy, consp conspiring to overthrow the established government. Dresses poorly, said a carpenter by trade. Notice as you go on and on, this person is a bum, he's unemployed, yet he's the same radical person, a symbol, a messiah, that the people, the radicals on earth are waiting for. He's not the bourgeois elements that live that lives in these mighty towers, but he is one of us. And he's going to walk day by day and struggle in revolutionary norms. And this here, folks, is an ideal expressed by both Du Bois and by Dr. King. It seems that I can hear the God of the universe saying, even though you have done all of that, I was hungry and you fed me not. I was naked and you clothed me not. The children of my sons and daughters were in need of economic security and you didn't provide it for them. And so you cannot enter the kingdom of greatness. This may well be the indictment on America as we continue to watch working class, working poor, and poor folks suffer daily. These are the realities that we witness. And yet over time, the American consciousness continues to really struggle with this identity of Christ. One of my favorite episodes here of Good Times, and boy, I can go on and on and on about Good Times. Um, but this image here uh, is found on YouTube about this debate over the color of Christ. Notice the year 1974 as the American conscious still wrestled with this identity of Christ. But keep in mind, it's not so much about the color of Christ. As we know, he was a Jewish brother. At the end of the day, the reality, of course, is about how black and white folk come together and create a new symbol, a symbol of hope, a symbol of, of perseverance, a symbol that will really bring us together and unfold in the days of W.E.B. Du Bois here at his 150th birth and in a year of um, the 50th anniversary of the assassination of King. In conclusion, a lot of debates here, particularly have been following the arguments between Cornel West and ta Coates. And again, that's another segment. I have a lot of thoughts on that. But I bring you to the Savior. Black Americans have been waiting for a black Messiah, the Savior of their race. Unfortunately for Barack Obama, he was that Messiah though it is the title handed to, it was the same title handed to folks such as King, but maybe not Du Bois Hint. If you talk to many folks, very few folks could A, recognize who W.E.B. Du Bois is or was, and very few can tell you any relevancy or importance of the great intellectual um, civil rights icon. No other American president has had to deal with complex matters regarding a single racial group the way Obama has. Eight years later, many are still asking, is Obama the end of black politics? Or in a waning days, the article by Tana Hissey Coates, such as, my president was black. In his essay, Coates would state, quote, Obama's victories in 2008 and 2012 were dismissed by some of his critics as merely symbolic for African -Amer Americans. But there is nothing mere about symbols. As we've stated, both Du Bois and King used Christ as a symbol and present today aimed at casting the new elements that, hey, there is hope. There's hope for all of us. And yet for many, Christ was Obama. Now that the American consciousness is aware of the lack of racial progress under the guise of the ruling class in the age of Trump, some people are willing to move beyond the traditional presidential narratives of past tendencies of white established Protestants who reign from a position of wealth and clout. Obama's election and its aftermath can be compared to, excuse me, could be compared to the arrival of Jesus Christ in the first century um, there in Judea. The people of Jesus' day were anticipating a great savior, one who would be unleashed and unleashed in a way in which his wrath would be noted at the end of the days of suffering. However, because Jesus was not the political savior the people anticipated, some of them embraced other narratives. Du Bois, unfortunately, after leaving the Socialist Party and rejecting that of Eugene V. Debs, saw another way in his admitted mistake in supporting Woodrow Wilson, a white supremacist. This, of course, problematic, which Du Bois would recount in great regret, thinking that this could be the narrative of moving forward. And yet, Du Bois would also know that that was a mistake and not within his radical norm or nomenclature. 
21st century Black Americans have moved on to new conversations about the arrival of a true Black Messiah. That true Black Messiah would be maybe the next great Black president, one who will establish on earth a kingdom free of racism and of police brutality. And while many Black Americans were frustrated with Obama, their frustration is different from that of liberal white America, who celebrated his arrival as a sign of their own progressive views on race. Black Americans made the mistake of claiming Obama for themselves. Many assumed he would arrive and eradicate the injustices placed on him with his racial identity. Yet, the reality, of course, is the fact that there has to be collective uniformity in thinking about the consciousness and the economic struggles of black and white folk. As Obama's term has now ended, Black Americans have realized he is not the hope for savior. Hence, there is tension between the expectations of a historically oppressed race and the ushering in of America as post-racial. Another element coined by white supremacy in many ways. But what Americans have discovered is a sense of white supremacy waiting to push back. As was the case in 1963 when the boys passed away, and of course, the passing of Dr. King too. Both of these individuals being really radical in their nature have come to be complex figures, both, both um, that of W.E.B. Du Bois and that of King. In his radical nature, as many Americans in their anti-communist sentiment that was definitely derived during that age of King, and of course, during the period of Du Bois, is still present in today. I bring you to Carnegie Hall, February 23rd, 1968. Here we start, let me go back to, go down for a second, to this slide here. Honoring Dr. Du Bois, a speech by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. We cannot talk about Dr. Du Bois without recognizing that he was a radical all of his life. Some people would like to ignore the fact that he was a communist in his later years. It is worth noting that Abraham Lincoln warmly welcomed the support of Karl Marx during the Civil War and corresponded with him freely. In contemporary life, the English-speaking world has no difficulty with the fact that Sean O'Casey was a literary giant of the 20th century and a communist, or that others express such elements, which is generally considered the greatest living poet. It is also worth noting, of course, with members, of course, expressing some sentiment who sit in the Senate as communists. It is time, as King would note, to cease muting the fact that Dr. Du Bois was a genius, but yet this genius chose to be a communist. It's irrational in many ways with the fact that America is an obsessive anti-communist state has moved beyond the solidarity of the many quagmires to be retained if it wants to move forward in scientific thinking. Sure, King would say to America that Du Bois was a genius and yet he elected to be a communist. King, who would elevate his status over time to grow much more radical in his frustration over the inequalities that were expressed during his time period. So here we think about this radical nature through a symbol of Christ in bringing about the realities of radicalism um, here on the eve of Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Both being radicals, both taking a different tone and a message to the people, but also the fact that people, particularly people of color, particularly black folks, looking for that, that next Messiah and that next Messiah being an American president. And yet this American president landed and yet much like Christ is being persecuted in the elevation of white supremacy in the age of Donald Trump. I want to show you just a few images as I now wrap up. And one of the things I like to do is I like to get your thoughts or questions as we move forward. I have to show you this image here. You know, I started off by saying that most of my life, you know, I just I didn't like King because I thought that he had been whitewashed and, and really created in a passive fashion. And so King continues to be deduced to a mere liberal, uh, someone who um, gave great speeches. Many of you probably saw this by Isaac Newton Ferris Jr., the nephew of King, and other black folks really aligning themselves with a champion of white supremacy in order to advocate their own vanguard in different ways. Um, a ruling class sentiment that some, and somehow been disoriented by the realities of the oppressed folk. This King, as King nephew stated, is what King would have wanted. I push back on that. 
king and advocate and champion against white supremacy, really want to bring about economic resolve, but never sit side by side with a man who wants to deport millions of people who should not be deported. I'm thinking about DACA. Uh, again, myth, white Jesus, not challenge. Um, this is by Princess Taylor, The Christ in Alabama, 1931. So I, I, this is a piece published by The Voice, and it's one really in the age in which we're starting to see the Scottsboro um, case emerge. At this time, the Communist Party was doing a lot of Southern organizing in the Deep South. Obviously, this particular piece here, Christ in an American image, this idea of love, uh, this notion here, as you can see from the quote, 1957, thinking about driving this, this notion of skin and class. But yet, as we treat and we look at King, someone whose radical message has been lost. This is coming out this week. Maybe you've seen it. Again, Jeremiah Wright, Goddamn America. We know that, that famous uh, statement uh, that he noted, but yet the New Yorker presents King taking a knee in celebration for the, for the oppressed in many ways, people who are speaking, who are voicing their thoughts, their opinions. I'm really excited to see what a lot of people are gonna have to say about this particular element here too. I'm going to move forward to Let's see, this image or this poem right here. Oh, no, I'm sorry, this statement right here. So we go through all of this, and what does it mean here in the 21st century, going back to Jeremiah Wright? Well, poor, discrimination based on blackness. Again, we're thinking about what does it mean for Jesus to be black, to walk the earth? If Jesus were to arrive as that symbol today, as noted by Du Bois and um, King, he would be discriminated based off his blackness, police brutality, cabs would pass him by. I'm pretty sure he'd be called a nigger. Christ, just like the rest of the folks who are walking beside him in his um, skin tone. Social and cultural norms, single parent home, work twice as hard. Some of those stereotypical, some of those are realities within this, um, in this avenue that's here. So I'm gonna wrap this up now and I, would open this time up for any conversations, um, thoughts, discussions. Thank you guys, I appreciate your time and attention. Okay, the floor is now open for comments or questions. To indicate that you wanna speak, just click the picture of the raised hand, click the raised hand icon on your um, control panel and we'll, I'll know that you uh, wish to speak and I'll be able to open your uh, mic. Uh, okay, Mark, your, your mic is open. Hi, this is Mark in Oklahoma. What I am asking is why has the online MLK archives really been um, censored by taking out a lot of uh, support that MLK had on Du Bois. That's a great, so, uh, okay. I'm gonna just make an, I'm gonna respond to that question, uh, D, just for a second, then we'll get some more. I'm gonna try and do that. One comment I can give you is um, a colleague of mine is going through the King papers right now, um, Professor Edward Bloom. And one of the things that he has concluded oftentimes is the fact that a lot of literature and information hasn't been has been released, but a lot has not, primarily for the fact that some people will say it's out there. It's just how do we look at it? How do we think about that information that's there? We go back to his Carnegie Hall talk, um, King's Carnegie Hall talk on um, the voice. For many people, they're unaware and unfamiliar with that. We're only recently reaching an age in which, though there's still anti-communist sentiment that's out there, folks, particularly of our earlier generation, have really come to recognize the fact that we're dealing with new and different realities. And thus, thinking about the old days, this anti silvertism this anti-communism, that's not really part of their DNA. And they're seeking a little bit more information and literature. But the other thing, too, is the idea that King is a complex figure. Uh, you know, the more I read, the more I think, the more I ponder about King, 
the more I'm amazed by how truly radical King was. There's still a debate among many people, was King a communist, was he not? I think we can all say that King was not a communist, King was not a member of the Communist Party, but King was highly um, sympathetic to the realities expressed by communists, thinking about the fact that Americans have become greatly distracted primarily through ideological contentions and not so much the welfare of day-to-day -day individuals. That's about as much as I can comment on. Um, if you, Mark, if you send me an email, I can, um, Edward Carson at the Brooks School, I can respond maybe in a little bit more comprehensive fashion and particularly put you in touch with Ed Bloom, who is actually doing some work through the, um, the King Papers right now. Okay, Michael, Madden, your mic is open. Michael. All right, so we're still, if you'd like to make a comment or raise a question, please use your the picture. Just click the raised hand and I can open your mic. Orpheus, now you need to unmute yourself when you're in. Just click and you can unmute yourself, Orpheus. Click your, your mic. Yes. There you go. It's open. I hope I don't take this way off topic, but I'm curious in thinking of these two intellectuals and I'm curious the juxtaposition against them and Malcolm X. Was Malcolm X considered a, an intellectual? And also, of the three, who was most radical, given the times they were in and, and everything? Your opinion. Orpheus, brother, thank you for that. I have a couple of thoughts on that. OK. Um, yeah, I don't know if anyone's waiting or not. If I can comment on that, that would be great. Oh. Okay, Orpheus. So I have a couple interesting thoughts uh, when it comes to Malcolm. You know, it, it depends on how you look at radicalism. Oftentimes, one of the things that I hear is that people want to get into get into this debate. You know, are you more of a brother who supports Martin Luther King because Martin Luther King again was treated and oftentimes seen as somewhat passive and not radical enough? Are you a a brother who supports Malcolm X, someone who's going to storm the streets, uh, has a strong more pointed language that's in place too. And I say this, uh, one, a couple things. Number one, all three, Du Bois, Malcolm, and King, they're all flawed human beings, um, all flawed. They're all human beings, like me, like you, like the rest of us. You know, one of the things I will say is I have probably the deepest admiration for Malcolm. And the reason why I see Malcolm is being highly radical in a different capacity is for the fact that here's a brother who lived a lifestyle in one way and stated the other that, you know what, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give up sleeping with all these women, all these white women, sleeping with people out of marriage. I'm going to, uh, I'm not gonna eat pork. You know, I'm going to surrender smoking cigarettes. I'm going to surrender the consumption of alcohol. I'm going to live a life as Allah has called me to live that life. And so to think about this brother, much if you go back to the biblical days of, of, of Saul, who was a, who persecuted Christians. And Saul became this radical brother and became Apostle Paul, who became a savior of these Christians, which is one of the most radical transformations in history. You see the same thing with Malcolm, a brother who was, who was radical, who was on the street doing all these things. I wouldn't say radical, but he was doing all of this stuff. And then for him, he came to find Allah and find his true calling. And one of the things we know about him is that true calling brought him to, into circles with King. We do know due to FBI um, um, recordings that there was a conversation right before Malcolm was killed between King and Malcolm. The fact that King went on a hodge, he went to Mecca, and he really discovered the real truth about interracial love and solidarity, though he continued to condemn America for his, his um, harassment on black people. He stated that, hey, at the end, it's all about the interracial progress. It's not about the fact that, you know, 
all white folks with blue eyes and blonde hair, the devil, like he once stated. He's gonna come to this conclusion that we've gotta work in solidarity with both black and white folks in moving forward. That promise, that radical thing that King was also professing too. And they took it in different ways. And so as it relates to the boys, you know, the boys is gonna be, he's gonna die in 1963. The boys is gonna die on the eve of King's um, march in Washington, DC. And it is true, Du Bois was highly suspicious of the civil rights movement. Du Bois and his radicalness, he believed that the civil rights movement in many ways was not gonna really come to fruition the way it should. And he would really write and note that while in exile in Ghana, seeing that this is just another step, but yet in being a little frustrated and bitter at that time, thinking that, hey, the only way things are gonna truly happen is through this interracial concept of working class radicals. And yet by 1963 at the death of um, W.B. Du Bois, it wasn't happening. And he's gonna express his um, indeed concerns from across the pond. Barbara, your mic is open. Barbara Russell, your mic is open. Elaine, I do not see a mic uh, for you. I see your hand is up, but I don't see. Uh, Jules, your mic is open. Jules, your mic is open. Norma, your mic is open. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. Good. Um, I just wanted to throw this in. A friend sent to me John Howard Lawson's The Hidden Heritage. And what he begins, if you're not familiar, I understand he was one of the first people to take the, uh, uh, not the fifth, but to oppose the McCarthy searches. Okay, you know about that. Uh, he starts off this book, The Hidden Heritage, with a d talk about with, with comments, not in detail, about what Christ and the other preachers were saying, the good of the people was what they were saying. It was immediately taken over by the uh, white uh, or uh, capitalist kinds of, or imperialist kinds of uh, magnifiers to take control over the language that was being expressed. Uh, and then he proceeded to talk uh, extensively from one end of the book to the other about people's uprisings and repressions. Just magnificent. Uh, it should be imbued in all of us to enjoy so that we know what we're doing. I'd like also to mention we categorize people as intellectual or genius or that they're critically thinking or not. Well, if we consider somebody to be critical think, critically thinking properly, we think about it because they agree with us, not because they're critically thinking. People start critically thinking from the time of their birth. And people are all geniuses. And people are all intellectuals. And when they're not cr classified that way, it's because of the alienation that keeps, them, keeps us all from living well together. It's not because they're not thinkers or not because they're not brilliant and uh, that they don't have this brilliant creative capacity that people have. We all have it and we're kept from it. <laughs> I have decades of being kept from it. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Norma. I, I, I will say, um, there's a lot of truth in that in terms of critical thinking and whether or not folks agree with us or not. Um, I, we're all human and I, I know for a fact I subscribe to that. I, I will say this, I vividly can say this with absolute confidence. 
Um, I'm not a genius, but brother W.E.B. Du Bois, he was a genius. He was a, uh, I think, historian David Levering Lewis called him the Berkshire prodigy coming from Great Barrington. Uh, someone who's brilliant coming from that interracial community going down south, starting off at Fisk and having to do most of his undergraduate work over again when he was admitted in a graduate school at Harvard because he came from a, a Negro college. Uh, and two, uh, the fact that um, he couldn't be quite the scholar that he perceived himself to be. So uh, it's, a, it's a good comment. And Du Bois, without a doubt, a genius. Thomas Connolly, your mic is open. You have to unmute yourself when you're in. There you go. Hi. Uh, first, I'd like to thank you very much for your presentation. It was uh, it was great. I, I just want to share with you, I, I did reread uh, that book, uh, Martin Luther King book, uh, Where Do We Go From Here, Chaos Your Community Again? And I found so many great quotes in there. And I think since he's a, a uh, such a icon and a a popular person that we celebrate his annual event and we celebrate, you know, his 50 years coming up. That organizationally, I would love to know more about the paperwork you have. And I think there's a lot we could do to uh, further uh, try to find ways to promote that for Chaos and Community. It was, as you know, it was his last book he wrote before he was assassinated. And uh, I just, uh, I just really am happy to hear this. We, we have in the, in our clubs in, in uh, Hartford and New Haven, we're going to have our Black History Month coming up, and uh, so we're looking forward to that. And uh, all of this, all of this buried material that isn't really out in the popular front, I'd like to find ways to get it out there. And thank you again. I thought it was a great presentation. Thomas, thank you so much. And if you could be in touch with me. Um, I would, it gives me an excuse to get up to Connecticut. Uh, it's just becoming, you know, a second home for me these days. So uh, reach out to me. I definitely love to um, work with you on that. So I appreciate the thoughts. William, your mic is open. Hi, William here. Uh, Professor Ed Carson, thanks so much for this talk. I've really enjoyed everything so far in the comments. Um, I was wondering if you had any general feedback on Reverend William Barber's current Poor People's Campaign as a continuation of these histories and trajectories and yeah, what you, what you think about where that's going right now? So we are, <laughs> I, I think it's a, it's a good start. I, I have a couple, I, I'm really inspired and moved by the fact that this is something that's starting to resonate much more within communities. I, I'm gonna say this, I feel free to agree or disagree with me on this. I've come to discover that very few people are actually aware of the Poor People's Campaign. And, um, and what's happening, of course, is bringing about a transformation for people to start to see King in a different way. So we think about this, the absence of understanding of this radical um, notion of King. And yet, in terms of what's happening now, I think people are going to be moved to really delve in and to um, talk about King in a different way. King has um, pretty much become a symbol of speeches, a symbol of, you know, just, just you know, love each other. Um, let's let's move beyond race and color. And yet we all know that it's problematic for all of us to say, you know, as a, as a black man here, you don't see my color, this or that. And so one of the things we're working on doing here in the Boston area is um, there are a couple things. One, we are um, some of the local chapters who are really starting to delve in and to work with the national framework of the Poor People's Campaign is created and generated a lot of local interest. Um, I'm on a, a, um, a conference committee uh, with my wife, and so there's generate, or excuse me, that's generating a lot of conversation and, and talk too about how do we inject the work of this socialist conference with that of the Poor People's Campaign. I have students who are asking me about this, and you know, again, you know, I was a pretty good student, and I have to be honest with you, I was not all that versed with the Poor People's Campaign um, when I was in high school, and I knew just a little bit about it, even in college. It was not really part of the conversation. Here it is, this great man giving a speech. Now what? Now here's the one thing though, unfortunately people do want to point out, and that is that the Poor People's Campaign was a failure. That's what people will talk about. And it didn't do what it was intended or what was supposed to happen with Abernathy. And yet this, um, this new awakening to the Poor People's Campaign, I think it's gonna really spotlight the successes of the Poor People's Campaign in the past and some of the good things that are gonna to continue to happen uh, now. So I appreciate the um, thought and the question. 
Art, your mic is open. Final question or comment. You just muted yourself. If you, this is you are. Joe Belly using Art's computer. <clears throat> Hi, uh, Edward. Hey, Joel. It's good to hear you. Uh, yep. Uh, I really want to appreciate the uh, the construct of your your whole presentation. I think it makes an important contribution, and I hope that it's published uh, somewhere that we can read as well as uh, listen to in order to think through. And um, uh, the speech that uh, King gave at Carnegie Hall, which you emphasize, mm -hmm. if you put that speech and he talks about we must be dissatisfied as long as anyone is uh, without a decent job or health care, et cetera. And you put that next to W.E.B. Du Bois' letter to Gus Hall joining the Communist Party. And he talks the same things about, um, uh, uh, well, he said universal selfishness uh, can never solve. And I want to be part of the day to create, you know, where every person has the, de the right to decent um, you know, to, to a job and health care and housing and all the basic things you mentioned uh, that a, pe a person needs to survive and be fulfilled. So uh, it's almost like a conversation uh, that happens and it's actually across decade there, but uh, I find it very exciting. And I also wanted to comment in terms of the um, Poor People's Campaign. One of the beautiful things that I think uh, Reverend Barber is doing there is a very wide concept of equality. And so he's including environmental, he's including climate change, of course, you know, prison uh, reform. Um, he's including many, many issues uh, in this Poor People's Campaign, LGBTQ. He's bringing everybody together for basic human rights. And if you really talk about basic human rights, you have to challenge capitalism. You cannot achieve that in capitalism. And I believe that Ping was coming to that conclusion. And Du Bois had been at that conclusion. And somehow uh, we have to, uh, that's why I think your talk is so important, and that we can popularize and, and develop, develop on this from those two giants. Thank you. Thanks, Joel. I appreciate the thoughts, and I really appreciate you um, contextualizing and conceptualizing uh, the position of the Poor People's Campaign because, yeah, it is um, uh, it's it's it, it's it's much more radical and much more inclusive, particularly in terms of some of the concerns that are endemic here in the 21st century. So I really appreciate it. Okay, uh, Professor Carson, we're we're at the end. Uh, so if you'd like to make any concluding remarks, please do. So I, I do want to say that if you, um, this work, it, it, it excites me a lot. And, and, and for those who know me, know that there is a, um, there's this, there's this love and really obsession with the life of, of, of W.E.B. Du Bois and how um, he really served, as I pointed out at the beginning, as this kind of this master, this teacher, that we look at King, and King really is going to kind of pick up the mantle and move forward, and really in a hopes of moving the nation in a much more radical uh, direction. Unfortunately, you know, his life was um, cut short at the young age of 39, and so the story wasn't finished. But I, I do think that, uh, as some folks have commented uh, just now, that there's so much work and so much room to do this work. I mean, if, you know, at the end of the day, you don't have to be a rocket scientist, a historian, or this or that. It's the fact that if, if we have any capacity to be radical individuals and really want to bring forth this element of the kingdom of truth, then this is the kind of stuff that we have to be engaged in. So um, I'll say this. Feel free to reach out to me. Um, you know, I'm, you can find me on, um, if, you're, if you're in a party, you can, you can get a hold of me. Uh, if you're not, I teach at, I'm at a residential school at the Brooks School, B-R-O-O-K-S, uh, here in, in, in Massachusetts. Send me an email, and I'd love to correspond with you about really, not so much about even my work and my scholarship, but even some of the greater things that we can do to get this narrative out there, because so many people need to hear this. So that said, um, I really appreciate you guys attending this. Thank you. 
Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Professor Carson. And we look forward to having everybody.